Welcome back to the Commanders Declassified Podcast. We are your official home for all things Washington Commanders. Come here. Come here. Look close. Listen close. We are now 4-1, and one, and we are atop the NFC East. We are the best team in the East, maybe the second or third best team in the overall NFC, and we are making big waves across the NFL landscape. Your Washington Commanders are doing excellent. Now, down to business. You need to like and subscribe to this podcast on all podcast platforms, audio, digital, video, anything you can do to consume a podcast, subscribe. Also, check out our site, commanders247.com, maybe a new URL in the future. We are working on it, but we have plenty of great articles out there for you. Eric just put up a piece, Graydon Jane Daniels progression so far. Mike just released content about the defense's progress so far this season. Make sure you check it out. Commanders 247.com. All right, fellas. It is Balmore week. How you say it? How you say it if you're from Baltimore? What do you call it? Balmore, Balmer. Balmore. Just Balmore. say hon at the end of it and you're good. Balmore, huh? <laughs> We dragon Mo, as they say in Baltimore, I guess. Uh, so listen, the Baltimore Ravens are three and two. They are coached by Jim Hardball. Wait, John, did I get the right Hardball? Is it John Hardball? John. It's John, John Hardball. Hardball. I'm sorry. Jim Hardball is Michigan. I'm a Michigan fan. My apologies. He's now with the Chargers. One thing I want you to understand about these Ravens is nobody knows who they are right now. They are three and two. They could very well be one and four. They very well could be four and one it did they just are that kind of team uh week one they lost to the chiefs 27 20 chiefs are undefeated no big deal right second week they lost to the las vegas raiders 26 to 23 i will say in that loss they are still trying to figure out what they wanted to do with derrick henry and then they've ripped off three straight wins they beat dallas 28 to 25 very easily could have been a loss they whooped Buffalo 35 to 10. That one's their win. You can't take it away from them. Then they played Cincinnati last week. They uh, lost or beat them in overtime, 41 to 38. They dang near lost that game. If Cincinnati's holder didn't mishandle the the, uh, the hold on that field goal attempt that went wide, wide left for them, Baltimore right now would be a two and three team. Instead, they're three and two. And here we are. So, they are obviously uh, our opponent for this coming week, and they offer some very interesting perspective. But before we dig too deep into the Baltimore matchup, let me get a quick recap of you guys' feelings on the matchup that we had ourselves this past Sunday. Eric, what did you think about the game last weekend? It was a great game. Um, Baltimore or, uh, Cleveland's offense is putrid. I knew it was bad. I didn't know it was that bad. Oh, my gosh, that's the worst offense I've seen in a long time. That was such a bad offense. Um, but I thought it was a huge step forward for Jaden Daniels uh, because Cleveland defensively came out with a fantastic game plan for him. Take They were going full-on man, pressing at the line of scrimmage, taking away the quick stuff. They were forcing him to run on the, on the read options, and they played those really well. Uh, and he had some hiccups early on. But they figured it out quickly, and he adjusted and, and made some huge plays. Um, and then I guess the next step we'll see is you know, we're going to have to see teams spy him. They're going to play. They're going to play man. They got to put a spy on him um, because, yeah, he just ate him alive when they went, man. He just took off. He ran for 80 yards. Really good game from Jaden Daniels. I was really impressed with him this week. Um, maybe his best game so far, even though the numbers weren't quite there. I thought, you know, the, the, the way he adapted was just amazing. Really good job. He's answered every question I had about him so far. Yeah, and uh, listen, I was at soccer, and I'm going to be at soccer during this game, <laughs> tournaments, this upcoming game, but I will watch on my phone. I was highly impressed with what I was able to see, um, more specifically with the defense. And I know Cleveland sucks on offense. Deshaun Watson, we said it on the last podcast, he has given up on the NFL and has no desire to be better. He is collecting checks at this point. It's very obvious. I'd like to shout out our podcast, too. We also predicted Jameis Winston would play some. That man played a snap at least, right? So we got that right. But all around, a total butt whipping. And, man, it feels good to do those kinds of things. And, yes, Cleveland's bad. But in the past, we have not taken care of bad teams. We did that on Sunday. Check plus from our guys. Mike, what about you? And um, that's what I wrote in the article. Like, I, I understand 
Cleveland offense was really bad schematically, uh, physically. The players were doing stupid stuff. They went, what, one for 13 on third down? It was like, it was awful. But I don't care. <laughs> like, we've seen this team play uh, down to their competition. We've seen this team play um, awful football versus awful teams. So the fact that they didn't play with their food this Sunday, I'm happy. Like, that was a nice performance. Like, when you have a bad offense and you have a good defense, shut them down. Neutralize them. Obliterate them. Get them out of there. Make them um, the controversial team for the next season or whatever. But um, as far as the offense, like, it, what more can you say? Like, they're, um, I think they're number three in the league now. With a rookie quarterback, yep. um, everybody was talking trash before the season. Like, oh, Jaden Daniels doesn't have this. Jaden Daniels doesn't have that. Third rank offense after five weeks. We're over a quarter of a season now. So this this Sunday is going to be a huge test, and I'm I'm looking forward to see it. Absolutely. Um, speaking of this Sunday, a little bit more on the Ravens. Um, they lost Patrick Queen. He went to Pittsburgh. Uh, you can ask the Steelers fans if they're happy about that or not. But what we've always said, I think, or at least I've always maintained, is that Patrick Queen was a lot better next to um, Roquan Smith than he is on his own as a linebacker. And I think that's proven to be somewhat true. Um, the Ravens in the draft, in terms of key additions, they had Nate Wiggins out of Clemson. This dude is really fast, really fast. Um, Roger Rosengarten, he's a tackle uh, from Washington. They had Adisa Isaac out of Penn State, Devontez Walker, wide receiver out of North Carolina, TJ Tampa, cornerback out of Iowa State, Rasheen Ali out of Marshall, quarterback Devin Leary, Kentucky, center Nick Samick out of Michigan State, and safety Sanusi Kane out of Purdue, Wiggins being the star of that draft class. Um and they lost a couple of coaches in this offseason. They lost their defensive coordinator. He went to Seattle to be their head coach. Mike McDonald, I think he interviewed with us during the offseason. And they also had uh, one of their defensive assistants go to Miami, I believe. And his name was Anthony uh, – I forget the last name. But um, uh, he also interviewed with us, as a matter of fact, for our head coaching position. Um, and I will think of his name in a second. But he went to – the Dolphins, I believe. Um, and their defense is suffering because of those losses. I mean, not solely because of the losses, but their defense is not what it wants. Anthony Weaver is the name of the gentleman I was thinking about. That being said, Mr. Eric, uh, our offensive coordinator, uh, talk to us about how Baltimore will play their key players and uh, a little bit more context into their playing style. Yeah, this is uh, the Washington Commanders are going to be like looking in the mirror this week because these two teams are built very similar. They function very similarly on offense and their game plans are going to be very similar on offense. The Ravens offense revolves, of course, around quarterback Lamar Jackson and stud running back Derrick Henry, who took a couple of weeks to get going, but he's really taken off. Um, last week against the Bengals, didn't have the best game until overtime. Then he ripped off that big run to put him in scoring position in overtime. Uh, to to ice the game, but I mean he's Derrick Henry, and even at 30 years old, with the dude's been a punishing physical running back. It's amazing that he's still doing at age 30. He's still running the way that he is because he's just fantastic, and he's been really good this year. Number one rushing offense in the NFL, uh, very solid passing game, averaging right about the same as what Washington is about 240 yards a game. Uh, they're rushing for 220 yards a game, um, and yeah, they're they're looking for balance on offense. They've got talent not necessarily elite talent at the receiver position i mean rashad bateman's a nice player hasn't really really matched his or met his full potential zay flowers is capable of some big plays also he's he, he'll make a mistake every now and then nelson Aguilar, who's on a mission to play for every team in the nfl he's out there um you know at the tight end position is, is pretty solid with mark andrews and isaiah likely uh you know likely is more of a big play type of tight end it seems he's made some really huge plays this year but he also kind of disappears from time to time whereas mark andrews is kind of steady eddie uh, but two two very good players there uh, at the tight end position. But yeah, I mean you're you're looking at uh, you know the the defensive line and linebackers get ready to work this week because you're going to get a heavy dose of Derrick Henry. Lamar Jackson is going to run the ball uh, and he can of course hit those wide receivers and tight ends. 
uh, and honestly running backs out of the backfield. Uh, this is a, a very balanced offense, a very powerful offense, a very efficient offense, and a, and a very good offense. Mm-hmm. There's going to be some fireworks. I think this is this is going to be a high scoring game this week because I don't think either defense is necessarily up to you know. I think offense, it's it's strength against weakness, I guess, in this game is, is the best way to put it. So, uh, you know, the commander's defense has been better uh, in the last few weeks. Hopefully they can keep that up because this offense is better than any that they've faced so far this year. Even Tampa's. Yeah, I'll tell you what, um, you know, Lamar Jackson is still just as unstoppable as he ever was. He's continued to grow as a passer. You saw some highlight plays this weekend against Cincinnati late in, or did I say Cincinnati? Uh, yeah, it yeah, wasn't that late in the game. Um, I think likely is to me from watching uh Baltimore, he's he might not start, but he's tied in one for that offense right now. Uh, Mark Andrews is kind of taking a step back, and I think Zay Flowers is is Lamar's go to target in the passing game. But Bateman has really done a lot this year, a lot more than I expected. Flowers doesn't seem to get in the end zone. Um, and Derrick Henry is Derrick Henry, man. That guy just never seems to lose a step. One thing that I think I saw a lot of this on social media this week is folks talking about Derrick Henry up the you know A and B gap. What I've noticed about Derrick Henry in the last couple of years is that he's running off tackle a ton, and that's where his big gains come into play is running off tackle or on sweeps to the outside to you know so that corners have to engage with him instead of going through you know the defensive line. And in that in that overtime, that's where he had that big run was also a sweep to the outside. So I've seen less of Derrick Henry up the gut and more of Derrick Henry off tackle, you know, outside the box, getting you know his big runs coming in the run game there. So definitely something to look for. Um, Mike, defensively, uh, our defensive coordinator, Mike, is going to tell us how the commanders are going to straight up shut down uh, the Ravens offense and who are going to be our key players in doing so we're not going to shut down the ravens offense i i hate to break the news and i hate to be a debbie downer but it's just not going to happen they have the number one ranked offense coming into this um game number one rank in rushing number nine in passing their offense is actually performing better than ours and you see how we've been cooking so imagine that this defense going up against that offense. But you know what, though? There, there is a path to success. All you have to do is stop Lamar Jackson, King Henry, Zay Flowers, and Isaiah Likely and Andrews. That's all. You just stop those players and everything will be fine. But seriously, um, I think this might be one of those times where you want them to run the ball. And I know it sounds crazy because you're like, oh, they have King and Henry and Lamar. Like, that's that's crazy. Um, but I just don't trust our secondary versus this offense. And it's not that the receivers are anything to write home about. Even Zay Flowers has his issues. Um, Bateman, he, like you said about likely disappears, Bateman really a go-ghost on you during a game. So um, it's, it's not necessarily – the weapons, just like it with us, it's not necessarily our weapons. It all starts and ends with the quarterback. And we're going to say this a couple of more times this episode, but that's the key. And you can't even like say you can do a bend but don't break defense where you allow them to travel up the field, matriculate the ball up the field, and get in the red zone and try to slow them down. Because last week, Lamar Jackson was six for six in the red zone passing with four touchdowns. Mm. Like, <clears throat> I was not joking. We're not going to be able to shut them down. The best we can do is find a way to contain them. Because that's what I wrote in the article. Like, we're, we're not going to shut them down. And I want to grade the defense on how much they limit the down. How much? The Ravens, the under 30 points, that's a huge W. A huge W. Even if they scored 28. Four touchdowns against this defense from that offense is a huge W, and I would expect Washington to win. Unfortunately, I just don't expect that to happen. Sorry, y'all. And uh, two of his red zone touchdowns went to Likely, I believe. So, like, Likely is their red zone playmaker. He's just a better athlete than anybody most teams have on the other side of the ball. 
speaking of combination of size, speed, athleticism, jumping ability, everything like that. Now, I forgot to mention our players. Um, if if I'm going to focus on slowing Lamar Jackson down, there's three players that I will heavily rely on. Of course, one, the heart of this defense, the soul of this defense, that man Frankie Luvu, man. Awesome performance on Sunday versus the Browns. I think he ended up with an ADP FF rating. I think that's the second time that happened this year from the defense. I think Wagner had an AD in week one versus the Bucks. Um, so, of course, we're going to need him. Um, Jeremy Chen, really, really important for him to have a good game on Sunday, man. If he can somehow, you know, contain Lamar Jackson, that would be great when he scrambles or runs the ball. And finally, our good friend, Jamin Davis. This would be a great game for him to evolve somehow, some way. I don't know if it's going to be like Pokemon where you're watching somebody get, um, watching your owner or something get destroyed and you just snap or something and you evolve. But I just hope those three players are on their A game. They're going to have to have an A game on Sunday. The entire defense is going to have to have an A game. But those three specifically, I think those three can contain or try to contain Lamar Jackson if they're on their A game. Yeah, Frankie Luvu, um, I think Dan Quinn has like kind of figured out how to use Frankie Luvu and Bobby Wagner, especially like last week, the way they were blitzing them. Uh, offenses just don't know what they're going to do like with them. It could be like Luvu could be coming up. It could be Wagner could be coming up. It could be both of them coming up. It could be neither of them coming. <laughs> Defenses just don't know what to do, but they really unlocked those guys the last couple of weeks. They've looked great. I think That's Chin right. is, is probably your anti-likely weapon, too. I think he's the guy you, you want probably to match up on likely, especially with Quan Martin possibly missing the game. Um, you know, he, he gives you – him and maybe St. Juice give you your best shot at covering that guy because they can at least be big and physical. But we'll just have to see. Because, again, likely will uh, disappear at times um, from the offense. But then he shows up and makes a huge play. So who, we'll see. It'd be Derek Forrest on likely. But so – um, so far this season, I'm going to give you Mark Andrews games. Um, week one, he had uh, two targets, two catches, 14 yards. Week two, four or five targets, four catches, 50 yards. Uh, week three, one target, no catches. Week four, one target, no catches. Week five, five targets, four catches, 50 yards. So he kind of maxes out at the four catches, 50 yards. Zero touchdowns on a year for likely – uh, week one, he had 12 targets, nine catches, 111 yards, and a touchdown. He went crazy that game. Week two, he had three targets, uh, two catches, 26 yards. Week three, he had one target, one catch, four yards. Week four, uh, two targets, one catch, 26 yards. And then and that, and a 35-point game, that's all he had. And then week three, he had three targets, three catches, 13 yards, but two touchdowns. So... If they do get production out of tight end position, I think it's really shifting to likely. They really, to your guys' point about the disappearing from time to time, like they really, between all the weapons they have, there's just so many options in that offense aside from just running the ball with their running back and the quarterback that no one person's going to get keyed on. They're going to go to Zay Flowers a metric ton, but it's all going to be primarily underneath stuff. So looking forward to it. All right, let's flip the field as we say here. Eric, uh, on the commander's side on offense, who's our key players there? And uh, what's our game plan going to be against this uh, susceptible Ravens defense? Yeah, the Ravens defense uh, really is – it's almost like a mirror image of, of Washington's so far this year. Other than the game against uh, – the outlier game against Buffalo where they held the Bills offense to 10 points, um, they've given up a lot of points. I mean, they gave up 38 points this week. They gave up 25 to the Cowboys – Gave up 20-some-odd to the Raiders, um, 27 to the Chiefs, so that you can score on them, um, you know, unless they play lights out and just have your number like they did with the Bills. And I don't – I didn't, unfortunately, get a chance to watch that game, so I don't know. Josh Allen was my quarterback in fantasy, and he stunk it up that week, so maybe that has something to do with it. Um, but, yeah, they're, they're, the yards are going to be there. My concern this week is Brian Robinson Jr. because I don't know if you noticed, but he didn't he didn't play at all in the second half, and I know he, he was nursing a knee injury early in the week. So I don't know if they pulled him just because they were so far ahead 
or if he reaggravated it, but I haven't seen anything on his injury yet, albeit I haven't looked very closely because I have a job. Um, so we'll, we'll have to keep an eye on that. Although, you know, Austin Eckler and Jeremy McNichols came in and did a great job in the second half against a, a, a Browns defense that I think is much better than the Ravens. Uh, but the Ravens can also, you know, mask the deficiencies of their defense by scoring so many points like they did last week. So it'll be a, a really interesting um, dichotomy. I don't think the game plan varies much. I think uh, you're going to look for 25 to 30 passes from Jaden, uh, and you're going to look for 25 to 30 rushes. And um, you're going to, you know, try to maintain that balance, be it if Brian Robinson can play or if, if he can't, you you go between McNichol and Eckler maybe sprinkle in some Chris Rodriguez there. I think I saw him in uniform once or twice this year. So, um, yeah, we're just going to have to – we're going to attack them. They haven't really shown the ability to shut down anything other than, than you know, Josh Allen and the Bills offense. Um, so we'll just have to uh, – you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So Cliff Kingsbury has been – he's been uh, getting his bag, so to speak, to the point where I'm starting to worry that he might be Philly's head coach next year, and I, I really would hate that. Uh, but we'll see. We'll we'll cross that bridge when we get there. But uh, yeah, don't if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Keep doing what you're doing. I you know I suspect maybe the Browns are gonna or the uh, Ravens are gonna try to put uh, like Roquan Smith or somebody to spy Jaden Daniels if they go man to man to man coverage and see if they can contain him that way. But he's he's been good at adapting and Cliff King, Ping, Cliff Kingsbury's been scheming things up so far. I don't expect that to change this weekend. I think the the, the Commanders will be able to score some points this weekend against the Ravens defense. Yeah, agreed. And I think so. The thing I think benefits the Ravens, and we have the same benefit on our side of the ball, is the Ravens scout team knows what to prepare for because with us, because they practice against Lamar Jackson all the time, right? So they don't really have to dramatically shift from their game plan for the scout team to help the first team offense get ready. They're going to be very familiar with that. Um, I like what you said. I think King, Kingsbury's got uh, a little bit of his work cut out for him, um, but I think he's down to do it. I think this may be a week where we know we have to score because most of the games outside of Cincinnati, you really didn't fear their offenses. But this is a week we have to score. I wonder if that's not going to force our offense to start pressing early and often instead of letting the organic rhythm of the offense come together. But we'll see. Mike, defensively, what is Joe Witt and Dan Quinn thinking about how to stop this uh, Baltimore offense? Um. I, wait, I thought I thought we were doing the risk on um, the commander's offense. What? I said I thought well, we you were here. We got to have I, a conversation. Did I, did I did I say both? I'm sorry, commander's offense. You know what I mean? I'm sorry. sorry. You threw me off. I'm like, wait a minute. What's happening? I'm sorry. Um, what's, 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 that's cool. my bad. I we're gonna have so a me, we're gonna have a meeting off air, guys. We're gonna get we gotta got, get this hammered out. This is this I got is so focused on saying Baltimore, <laughs> trying to get that Baltimore accent, and I blew up the whole spot. You know what I mean, though. How is it's Baltimore cool, though. trying to stop our offense? Uh, so usually Baltimore ranks pretty high overall on defense, but this year it's not looking too good statistically. They're 19th overall, which is confusing because they're first in the run. But then you look and you're like, oh, shoot, they are 31st against the pass. I think those numbers aren't telling a full story, though. Because off because their offense is so powerful, the defense, I feel like they get, they get passed on a lot. And a lot of those yards are, I'm going to say, empty calories, so to speak. Um, Washington, they're like I said about the Ravens offense, they are good, they're moving the ball, they're number four overall, not number three. I, I apologize, they're second in rushing, 14th in passing. So, I feel like if the commanders want to um, pour up points, they're going to have to find a way to establish the run, but they're going to be able to pass on Baltimore. And I actually talked to a Ravens fan on Monday and I asked them about the defense. Asked him like what's going on um, with the team, and he did say that their interior line are strong. Um, and in a beak way, I think that's his name. One of the uh, defensive tackles, and Trey Jones is the other defensive tackle. Excuse me if I mess their names up, but we'll definitely get the norm on Sunday, I'm sure. But the other tidbit that he gave me, Rokon Smith has been attacked in the passing game. 
And I look at some tape, and yeah, teams are going after Rokon Smith in the passing game. So it could be a big game for Zach Ertz on Sunday, man. But one way or another, Washington should be able to move the ball. I don't think the Ravens secondary is as strong as it should be. I also think um, Humphrey is still out, too. I, I, I don't think he's played at all this season, matter of fact. If he did, it was like one or two games. But um, losing him definitely affects their um, secondary overall. But Kyle Hamilton, he kind of scares me. He's like Jeremy Chin 3.0. <laughs> like, he's he does the things that Chin can do and better. So we're definitely going to have to look out for him. But if I were Baltimore, I would do all I can to stop the running game and force Daniels to pass because even though he's completing 77% of his passes, um, it just will work well if you can disrupt their run. And I think Baltimore may be able to do that, but I think Washington knows just. Right on, man. Right on. All right. It's time for key players that are going to make the difference in the game. Eric, I'm going to start with your one or two key players that are going to be the difference in this game from either team. All right. I think my key player this week, I'm going to go outside the box, and I'm going to say this is the week that Ben Sinnott shows up and shows out. This is where he gets – I don't even know if he's got a catch yet this year. He's got like three targets. We're going to see Ben Sinnott make some plays this week, and this is just completely out of left field for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think I think Sinnott – I'm going to go ahead. He's going to be my difference maker because he's just going to show up and – uh, I don't know. Maybe he'll be the one burning Roquan Smith in the past game. Uh, outside of that, Austin Eckler, especially if Brian Robinson's not going to be available, um, if that knee injury is, is flaring up on him, or if he can't, if he's not a full go. And you know, e Eckler came in, had a really good, had a couple of really good runs last week. Um, got got involved in the passing game. So yeah, uh, Austin Eckler probably going to be a key player because again, I don't know how healthy Brian Robinson is. By the way. Man, I thought Austin Eckler was faster than what he is, I guess. On that 50-yard run, he had a complete breakaway, and he just didn't separate from the defender in the open field. I mean, it was an amazing run, but it his, and then I looked up his 40. I think he's like a 4-5, a high 4-5, 4-6 guy. It really showed up on that play because I'm like, man, this is a house call. Oh, wait, no, it's not. It's a good 50-yard run, but love Eckler, though. Love what he's done for us. Also, with Brian Robinson, something I've noticed, and I think it's because he's largely – there's some health issues going on with his knee, I think it is. Um, his yards per carry average, two out of the last three games, have been under three and a half yards of carry, so something to look at there as well. Um, Mike, who's your key player uh, for this game? I don't know how this keeps happening. I kind of planned for it this episode, though. But um, we went a whole episode again without mentioning McLaurin. I don't know how it keeps happening, but mm. if he can, and I didn't say this um, in my segment on purpose, because I wanted to save it for this segment, but if he can force the Ravens to focus more on him, it could really open up the passing game for everyone else. He isn't necessarily a decoy, but the more attention he draws, the better for Washington on Sunday. Okay. I can dig it. We always forget about McLaurin, which is Eric's favorite player on the team. Is that still true, by the way, Eric? 100% still my favorite. Although I will acknowledge he did not have a great second half uh, against the Browns. But still, uh, every nobody's perfect. Yeah, Terry's close. Yeah, still my favorite player. Every every once in a while, Terry's body catching comes up, you know, short a little bit. But he's an amazing receiver, though. I mean, no complaints. By the way, Eckler's a 4-4-8 40 guy for some reason i thought it was four five four six but that was seven years ago i was just surprised yeah. he got caught granted quarterbacks are really fast too it just would look weird all right my key player is um gonna be justin tucker from the baltimore ravens justin tucker is an amazing kicker but he's not what he once was i think he's going to miss a critical kick that is going to be the difference in this game all right Score predictions, outcomes, Eric. Set us off, man. This one's uh this one's tough. I think it's gonna be it's shaping up to be a high scoring game based on the two offenses against these two defenses. 
this is clearly, you know, uh, the Bucks had a fantastic offense and they put 37 points up on this D. I think the D's improved quite a bit since then. Uh, it's sort of settled into what Dan Quinn's been doing. So uh, I'm going to say the Ravens. I'm going to pick the Commanders. Why not? I'm going to take the Commanders 33-31. I don't know why, but I'm going, I'm rolling. Just this is the, this is the litmus test. You know, I've been pumping the brakes so far this year. You know, everybody's everybody's been glazing them for for a couple of weeks now. Haven't really beaten anybody. I mean, hallmark of a good team is to beat the teams you're supposed to beat, and that's 100 percent what this team's been doing. Again, this are the you know six and 14 is the combined record of the teams we've beaten so far this year. If they can beat the Ravens, who are legit, and I actually still think the Bengals are going to be legit once their defense gets some players back, uh, but if you can beat a legit team on the road, like the Ravens in a game that a lot of people are going to be watching, this is your litmus test. And I think Jaden and the, and the commanders are up to it. And I'm going to go, I, I didn't come in here intending to pick this. I was going to pick Baltimore, but I don't know. I, I caught a feeling. I caught a feeling on the podcast. I'm going to roll 33, 31. Uh, commanders this week. Okay. Um, here's what I'm going to say. Washington's number four in time of possession because we run the ball. Baltimore's number one in number scoring. This year, Baltimore's number eight in time of possession because they run the ball. Um, both teams average over 31 minutes of uh, time of possession. I think because these are really possession heavy teams, the scoring's not going to be quite as high as what people think. I think both teams are really going to rely on the run game to generate offense for them um, with our quarterback, with our running backs. Um, so to me, you're going to have a lot of sustained drives. I think that shortens the game and doesn't allow for many points to be scored. I'm going to say the commanders are going to go 24, the Ravens 22, and the commanders improve to five and one on the season. Mike? I completely disagree. <laughs> it's going to be fireworks. <laughs> Sunday is going to be a movie. I'm telling y'all, I've been telling people all week, this game is going to be crazy. You got Jay and Daniels. You got Lamar Jackson going head to head. Not um, literally, but, you know, figuratively speaking. And points, 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 points. Bat the over. Bat the over. And, unfortunately, that's where my excitement ends because I think Washington's going to lose. I got Baltimore 45. Ooh. Washington 33. And you are looking. Yeah, one thing I'll say is about the time of possession and the sustained drives. That's all true. But both teams score when they have those sustained possessions. Like they don't punt. So uh those those <laughs> time of possession, those end in those end in touchdowns and field goals, not not punts. So uh I, I, I think fireworks are in order. 45 31. That's crazy. But let's do it. Oh, 33 months. 33. We both got them scoring 33 points. 45 to 33. Right. 45 33. I think I think here's what's gonna happen. Yeah, Baltimore. Here's what's gonna happen. Like game gonna be kind of going back and forth for the first first half, first three quarters. But in the end, we we have an untimely turnover while we're down. Baltimore goes to score, and that's how they make it a double digit lead. But we get back on track, score a couple of more touchdowns, but they match us with a couple of touchdowns. So it ends 45-33. Mm. Mike Stradonis. Well, we don't like your prediction. <laughs> you right, say you don't us, like um, it? Think, no. Commander's going to win this time. They're going to win. <laughs> um, to everybody listening, make sure you go to Commanders 247. That's Numbers 247, Commanders247.com to read all the content and articles that we have there. Like, comment, subscribe. We love reading the comments. A lot of you guys comment as you watch or listen to the episode. That is brilliant to do because it gives us the compartmentalized and segmented comment so we can always respond to quickly. Thank you again to everyone who is listening to this podcast Let's go get another win. Let's go five and one. Let's get one step closer to the playoffs. Commanders declassified. We are out of here. <laughs>